Hey Fight fans, well actually I should probably think of my own saying, and uh, that's Michelle. Um, this is Rob Tebbett for Behind the Gloves. Um, many of you have, have watched my interviews before. I'm the uh, annoying British voice behind the camera that you have all been giving me great input on over the last few months. Um, something different today. Uh, we want to actually talk in front of the camera, or rather I will talk in front of the camera. And we're going to give an assessment and a breakdown of how I felt the Anthony Joshua versus Carlos Takam fight went, which was obviously the recent IBF and WBA super heavyweight title fight at Cardiff's Principality Stadium. Um, first and foremost, I felt that the fight was a lot more entertaining than perhaps people would have assumed going in. I felt that Joshua, while heavy, and while slow in stages, actually dealt with the threat of the late replacement well. Uh, I think there were things that he did well and things that he did not so well. And um, that we'll come to next. Um, first of all, I think major props to Carlos Takam. Took the fight on 12 days notice. Um, despite the uh, rhetoric that we heard in the build up to the Joshua fight about Takam being training for Joshua and um, he'd been you know, training for Joshua for nine weeks. I mean, that wasn't the case as, um, as Takam alluded to in some of the pre-fight press conferences and then in the immediate aftermath in the ring, um, Takam was actually due to fight next week. Um, but that being said, he took the shot, um, came in at very much short notice um, and gave a very good account of himself. I mean, he's, he's a rugged, tough, Dude, um, I think a lot of guys, a lot of fans in particular, um, I think it's that crossover effect um, from Anthony Joshua reaching a new, you know, a new audience of boxing fans who maybe weren't as clued up on Carlos Takam as a fighter than maybe some of us, some you know, hardcore boxing fans were. Um, I never felt Takam would go in and just be blown away. He's 36 years old. He's a man who's tremendously experienced. Um, when he's lost fights, he's always been very competitive. I mean, people will allude back to the the Alexander Povetkin fight, which was a great fight. Obviously, Povetkin ended up winning by knockout, but a very competitive back and forward fight. I mean, it's not a case of of Takam just going in and rolling over as soon as it gets tough. I mean, and there were opportunities for him to do so. Um, I think it was the third or fourth round, uh, the fourth round, I believe, where Takam was cut badly um, and then dropped by Joshua. I mean, the man's 36 years of age. He came in at 12 days' notice. I think if he would have got up, um, initially his body language didn't look great anyway, but if he would have got up and then said, you know, I've had enough. I mean, considering the state of his face and you know the fact that he was in there with a young, hungry champion like Joshua on 12 days' notice, I think he would have been forgiven. So, you know, not wanting to go on and take an inevitable barrage of punishment, which is what he did. Um, but still, he stuck to it, he carried on, he bit down on the gum shield and took some heavy shots and actually was finding his way back into the fight in the later rounds. Um, I felt that he enjoyed his best spells of the fight in the 8th and ninth round. I felt that Joshua slowed badly um, and quite dramatically as well. Um, of course, there was the headbutt in the second round, I believe, the first of the second round with Takam. Um, which obviously had its, you know, had a role to play with Joshua's stamina. Um, after the fight, it's been, you know, it's been released that he didn't actually sustain a broken nose, but I mean, that kind of swelling and that kind of damage. Um, it was one of the first times that we've seen Joshua visibly damaged. I mean, I know he was dropped in the, the Vladimir Klitschko fight, but he was, you know, you know, he was just marked up. This was the first time we'd seen some, some real blood. And he was actually in quite a bit of distress um, after taking that headbutt from Takam. So, I mean, that's that's going to play a factor as he moves on into the fight. Having said that, uh, a lot of the pre-fight talk, particularly from the weigh-in, was Joshua weighing in at 254 pounds. Career heaviest. It's a very, very, very heavy man. Particularly when you're undertaking an exercise like boxing, where it's an awful lot of endurance and cardiovascular endurance. I mean, dragging that kind of beef around the ring is, you know, it's inevitably going to tire you. Um, taking the headbutt out of the equation, um, I still felt Joshua tired very quickly, very dramatically. I felt that Takam boxed a very smart fight in the opening few rounds. I mean, a lot of the talk before the fight was that Takam was going to come and be aggressive and force the pace on Joshua, which was just, in my opinion, never going to happen. I mean, you're going into a fight against a guy who's 250 pounds plus, a big knockout artist, 
um, who has already showed in his previous bouts with Vladimir Klitschko and in, in some segments of the Dillian White fight that he may have a stamina issue. Um, I felt that Takam was always going to do what he did and that was try and survive the early stages, which he did very well. Um, until the fourth round where he was hit by a combination and then cut and then inevitably dropped, Takam pretty much negotiated the, the danger rounds, as it were, the first three and four rounds pretty comfortably. Um, he didn't offer much offensively, um, the odd jab or pot shot here and there, but the fight was never going to be won by Takam in the opening few rounds. It was only ever going to be lost by him, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, he got through the crisis in the fourth round, which many people, myself included, felt that you know he wasn't going to. Um, when he was cut, there was the there was the initial turn to the ref, Phil Edwards, who we'll come on to later. But you know, he he bit down on the gum shield and he showed a lot of heart and he got through it. And I mean, I think Joshua fell into the same trap or a similar trap that he fell into in the Vladimir Klitschko fight. He had his man hurt. He had his man down, and then in the fifth round, he came out and he threw the kitchen sink at Takam, trying to get him out of there. Now, Takam is old enough and experienced enough that he knew what was coming and knew what he could achieve by su surviving that storm. So, making it through the fifth round, the sixth round, and going into the later rounds of the second half of the fight was always going to be his game plan. I mean, the fact that he was hurt obviously meant that he had to, you know, he had to do what he had to do to survive the fight anyway. Um, that being said, I think Joshua again showed naivety. Um, when you've you've got a history of gassing or appearing to gas in the Vladimir Klitschko fight, which obviously ended well for him, I thought that he may be slightly more measured in his approach to Takam in the fifth and sixth round. I think he exerted a lot of energy. Um, Takam was able to find safe areas in the ring and you know safe exit points and and really you know, avoid some of Joshua's best work. Joshua wasn't really able to sustain anything in those fifth and sixth round, despite the energy that he was putting in, which was considerable. Um, I felt that Joshua struggled badly to cut the ring off. Um, Takam, who's not known as, you know, he's not a Jersey Joe Walcott, Muhammad Ali, Floyd Mayweather and the lightweights, you know, he's not that kind of fleet-footed defensive wizard, but he was still able to find pockets of the ring to, you know, escape Joshua. Um, Joshua followed him, which again, when you're carrying around 250 pounds of muscle, is going to tire you out, um, which we saw throughout the fight. Now moving into the second half of the fight, I felt that Joshua abandoned his jab. Um, he's not the kind of fighter to me who looks like he can keep that, that I mean like Larry Holmes or, or Vladimir Klitschko to keep that jab prying and popping out for a full 12 rounds. You mean, I don't think he has the stamina for it. I think it's at times becomes a range finder for him, but when you're not cutting off the ring, that inevitably, you don't set up your offense from it. So if you're not cutting off the ring and you're pouring with the jab, you're unable to sustain what comes afterwards, which I think Joshua will learn from. Um, as the fight progressed, I felt that Takam was coming into the fight. He was starting to take a few more risks, perhaps after surviving the, the fourth round, the fifth round, the sixth round, and then with Joshua tiring also. Um, and he started to show a little bit more adventure in his work, a bit more creative, you know, un, you know loosening up and, and actually throwing more shots. I think he had a very good ninth round or eighth or ninth round um, where he actually landed several right hands onto Joshua, who took them well. I mean, Joshua was never in any trouble throughout the fight. Um, certainly from a, you know, a physical pain point of view, I felt that his, his stamina was obviously an issue um, throughout various different stages of the fight, but I mean, I don't think he was ever in any, you know, any, in any danger of losing the fight. But um, I think they're certainly now starting to show chinks in the armor um, of Joshua. It's, and it's not, that's not a criticism. I mean, he's fought 20 fights. He's a unified world heavyweight champion. That's a tremendous achievement for somebody so young, particularly when considering his, his amateur record, which still, he won an Olympic gold medal, but, he never had an extensive amateur career, he's still very much learning on the job. So when I say, you know, chinks in the armor or things that Joshua needs to work on, I'm like, they are criticisms, but they're not me, I'm not hating on Joshua, just pointing those things out. Um, but I think people are starting to see it now, um, that he can potentially be outboxed. Uh, Vladimir Klitschko, who's, I mean, one of the great heavyweight boxers of the last 
20 years, certainly. Um, one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, like it or not, he's tremendous longevity. But he was able to offset Joshua, jab, move, feint, forcing Joshua to constantly reset. And that's again, Joshua not being able to cut off the ring. Um, Joshua not being able to impose himself on somebody who's not just standing there. And that, again, that's not, that's not me hating or picking on his opponents, but when he's faced in, in the two fights that he's faced somebody who's willing to move around the ring um, and willing to not stand there and trade with him necessarily, I think Joshua has struggled. Um, I don't, again, think that he struggled in a sense of losing the fight to Takam, but I do feel that he struggled to impose himself on Takam. Um, I think that Joshua is too heavy. I mean, I think that's that's quite obvious. Um, does he need to be 254 pounds? I mean, earlier on in his, in his career, we saw a lot leaner uh, Anthony Joshua. Um, and you know he still he still has speed, but it's not the same as it was when he was that leaner, fitter version of himself. Um, and is now obviously as the fights are progressing and going longer, he's starting to show you know, his lack of stamina. Um, after the fight, I think people are in kind of two camps. I think there are those who appreciate. The fact that it was a late change of opponent and maybe that a lot of people were underestimating Carlos Takam as a fighter. And then there are those who are, you know, Joshua's been exposed, he's a fraud and he can't do rounds. I mean, I know I'm sort of sounding a little bit like the can't do rounds things, which is pointing that out. Um, but I think much like a lot of things in boxing, it's, it's somewhere in the middle, you know. I think, yes, people were underestimating Takam, and yes, it was difficult for Joshua to, you mean, you Kubrat Pulev and Carlos Takam, height-wise, fighting style-wise, very, very different fighters. So that kind of change at the last minute is obviously not going to help him, uh, particularly when you've been in camp for so long like Joshua has. Um, but in the same vein, I don't think that, you know, people who are saying about the stamina and the fact that Joshua does have things he needs to work on, uh, you know, I don't think that's unfounded. I think like most things in boxing, it's somewhere in the middle. I think Joshua did well and he'll learn a lot from the fight. I know something that Lennox Lewis said, um, it's the perfect learning fight for him at this stage of his career, which it, I believe it is. Um, there are, you know, it, it was a good test for him um, with the fact that it was the late change and the stylistic changes of the opponent. So it's a good test for him, but much like any other test, there's varying different degrees of how well you pass the test. And this is my, my main point of contention. I think that Joshua has things he needs to work on, but I'm not sure there are the heavyweights out there that are able to expose his flaws. Um, off the top of my head, is there anybody who, can, who dances around the ring for 12 rounds? Other than Tyson Fury, I'm a huge fan of Tyson Fury. I think he's a fantastic fighter, very unique fighter, awkward, long, rangy, fast. But at the minute, he's 25 stone. Um, he hasn't fought in two years, so as much as I'd like to see him back in the ring, until I see it, you know, there's, there's no real basis to go on at the minute. Um, Deontay Wilder, terrific puncher, uh, a lot of raw power. Boxing skill, in my opinion, is not up there with, with your Tyson Furies. Um, whether or not he has the ability to box for 12 rounds on the back foot against Anthony Joshua without getting caught is, for me, very much up in the air. Uh, Wilder doesn't historically hold a shot very well. He was rocked by um, Eric Molina. I think he was, he's been hit a few times throughout his career and you know, he's shown reactions against guys who aren't as heavy hitting as Joshua, who's not. Joshua's not a one punch guy. And Isaac Chamberlain, who sparred with both guys, referred to Anthony Joshua's punches like sledgehammer shots, whereas Deontay Wilder is a sniper rifle. You know, it's that, it's that zap power of Deontay Wilder against that thudding, every punch hurts Anthony Joshua. Um, but whether Deontay Wilder can be as disciplined and has the boxing brain to, to box Anthony Joshua on the back foot for 12 rounds without getting clipped, I'm not sure. We've not seen that. The closest thing we've seen from Deontay Wilder to that was his first fight of Bermain Stavern. Obviously the rematch is coming up this weekend, um, which to be honest I don't think proves an awful lot between the guys. Um, 
but yeah, it's 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 nicely poised. Um, particularly now we are starting to see that Joshua is you know is considerably far away from the finished article. He'd be the first person to admit that himself. Uh, very humble man. Stay humble. Stay hungry, um, Mr. Joshua. But it's now getting to the point where the only fights that we can really see him in are against guys like you, Joseph Parkers, who's been underwhelming in his last few bouts. Will that prove or disprove anything that we're going to see from Joshua going forward, or will it confirm anything? I'm not sure. Um, the Deontay Wilder fight, I think, will be a fun firefight. Um, again, will it be the kind of fight that proves or disproves anything about Anthony Joshua? I'm not sure. Um, unless Deontay Wilder does box on the out outside for 12 rounds and and you know is, is able to outbox him because I think Wilder, while he has tremendous power, is a great natural athlete, is not what I would call a skilled technician. I mean he's improved, um, he's improved in the ring uh, under, his, under his new trainer. Um, so yeah, I mean he can box on the outside for 12 rounds but um, unless he pitches that perfect game I think he'd be more likely to knock Joshua out than outbox him over 12 rounds is what I'm saying. But yeah, I think I think without Tyson Fury coming back, there's not going to be other than Wilder versus Joshua, which is going to be a shootout. I don't think there's going to be that stylistic question. You know that boxer versus puncher. Can can Joshua get Fury before the end of the 12 rounds? I'm not sure that that exists. I mean, a lot of people will. Prefer to see the um, Anthony Joshua Deontay Wilder fight um, from a sense of you know somebody's getting knocked out. That fight's not going past six rounds. You wouldn't have thought um, unless Wilder does decide to box, which I don't think he will. Um, so yeah, I think Joshua, while coming through the test, probably rather than raising more questions, he sort of exacerbated questions that already existed potentially about his stamina. Um, his ability to cut off the ring, um, how much weight he carries into the fight. But in the same vein, I'm not sure where the heavyweight division is going over the next 12 months, where those questions can be answered. I think if Joshua knocks out Parker and knocks out Wilder, then those questions will still remain until somebody provides the test, you know, Tyson Fury. Um, so yeah, that's my... I, I was about to say that's my conclusion of the of the fight and what I saw of the fight. But um, Phil Edwards, referee Phil Edwards, um, far from me to put a referee on blast. They do a very very difficult job, um, and they have the best seat in the house, man. I mean, it is literally. Uh, I've watched many fights at ringside, and you know there are things that you can't always see, and you know there are things that you you, you might miss. Um, referees are very very attentive. Phil Edwards is a hugely experienced ref. Um, refereed a lot of world title fights. Um, somebody who is has always done a good job. I mean, I'm not. I'm, I don't think, off the top of my head, he's been involved in particularly many controversies going um, going back. But he stopped the fight too soon, um, and I don't think there's really any question for debate about that. I mean, I know boxing is a brutal sport. You've got Anthony Joshua, all 254 pounds of him. Um, you know, unloading on, on Carlos Takam, who at the time, you know, had been cut over both eyes. He'd already been dropped. I mean, he was losing. It was a 10th round stoppage. I think he'd lost at least eight of the previous nine rounds, certainly on my card. Um, so whether or not he could have won the fight, I don't know. But I feel that given the fact that he, particularly going back to what I said about, he got up in the fourth round, he was cut to pieces. He'd seen the ringside physicians X amount of times. And he wanted to carry on. Um, he didn't want to take his money and go home. I mean, it was a considerable career highest paycheck for Carlos Takam. It was something that you know he'll never get again unless they get the unless they get the rematch sorted, which is highly highly unlikely. Um, he'll never get that again. So he could have gone. He could have walked away with his four or five million or whatever it was, um, and then you know lived to fight another day or just gone into retirement and nobody would have, you know, nobody would have grumbled. But the fact that he chose to carry on and he was there in the 8th and ninth round, throwing back, started the 10th round very well. Um, I think he deserved to see the final bell. He took some shots, he was rolling at the hips and he was covering up and then 
Phil Edwards came in and stopped the fight. Um, yeah, I think if you're gonna stop the fight, the fight could have been stopped at numerous other occasions throughout the fight. Um, fourth round, any number of times when the ringside physicians came in. If you, I mean, if you want to save him from himself, then you know let the doctors stop it. And you know when people can see the crimson mask of Carlos Takam's face, I don't think anybody's going to complain. But to stop the fight when it was stopped, I mean, you heard 70,000 plus fans at the Principality Stadium all disagreed. Uh, pretty much all disagreed. Um, so that speaks volumes. I mean, Anthony Joshua is a superstar, he's the darling of British boxing, um, and his fans weren't happy that, that the fight was was called off in the way it was. I think Carlos Taka gained an awful lot more than just a career high purse. I think he showed that, you know, not only is he has he still got miles left in the clock, as it were, at 36 years of age, but he can compete. I mean, Anthony Joshua is a lot of people's consensus number one number one heavyweight. And Carlos Takam, he was competitive. Uh, I probably wouldn't go any further than that. He competed with Anthony Joshua um, and was still there. And who knows, with Joshua's stamina, the way he slowed throughout the fight, who knows where that could have gone in the 11th and 12th round. And I think Phil Edwards was potentially looking for an excuse to pull him out before he got hurt. And then once, I think he shipped the left hook that rocked him. And I think there and then, Phil Edwards had, had decided that he was going to stop the fight. Um, it just so happened that Takam had shaken off the left hook like he'd shaken off hundreds of other shots seemingly, was bending at the waist, and then Phil Edwards came in and did his thing. But um, yeah, I mean, Anthony Joshua, a lot to work on, but still undefeated. Um, he's a humble enough fighter and a good enough fighter, obviously very talented. Um, that he will go away and he will work on the things. Whether or not he comes into the next fight at you know, 254 or heavier or lighter remains to be seen. I'm, I'm not a physiological expert um, or a boxing expert before anybody tells me off for making this video. Um, but I feel that he may, he may come in lighter next time. I think he may or certainly adjust the way he fights to, to fit in with that 254 pound frame. You can't be chasing guys around the ring um, when you can just cut the ring off and you make the ring smaller and you know, trap tack him. But yes, I think moving forward, the heavyweight division is nicely poised. Um, the fight that I want to see the most is Tyson Fury against Anthony Joshua as a Brit. I mean, I'm gonna get all sorts of abuse now from you lovely American fans. Um, I think that throws up the most interesting stylistic fight. Um, while Wilder and Joshua, you know, it's a guaranteed knockout. I'm um, something of a bore in a sense of I like to see, you know, clashes of styles and stuff. And um, I think that that would present the most interesting fight. Um, that being said, Fury is, despite these these recent reports, he's still a long way away from, I believe, returning to the ring, if at all. Um, He's been out of the ring for a long time and is considerably out of shape. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But yeah, that's my take on Anthony Joshua versus Carlos Takam. Please let me know if you enjoyed this. If not, I will probably still do it again, um, just in some in a different sort of way. Um, but yeah, something different here today at Behind the Gloves. Um, I hope all of you Michelle Joy Phelps fans didn't mind staring at this. Um, I appreciate that I'm not Michelle Joy Phelps. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed what I had to say anyway, and maybe we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. Hey Fight Fans, it's Michelle Joy Phelps, and if you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, make sure you go ahead and do so by clicking right here.